Hey there friends, Jeff Fritz here, and I'm going to start talking you through the beginnings of working with an existing .NET application and getting it running with some of the features that .NET Aspire provides for us. And in this episode of the series, we're going to specifically add service defaults into our existing project. Well, what is our existing project? There's a link down below in, in the description to the GitHub repository that has all the samples, the slides, and the documentation for this series. I recommend you check out that link and jump in and get started with us inside a folder that's labeled Start With API. Go ahead into that GitHub repository and grab that series of code that's in that Start With API folder, load it up in Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code like I've got here, and we can get started building and talking about our application. All right, so this is called My Weather Hub, and it has an API project here, as well as a website down here on the bottom. And if we take a look at this, just to get an idea as to what it does, I'll go out to, to the command line, and, and I'll start each of these two projects separately so that we can have them connect to each other and start talking and and have the website query the API to go get some weather data for us. I'll open my command shell here, and I'll start off with running that API project. So uh, I'll go into API, and I'll just .NET run this one. Now, as that's getting started, because I also want the website to go with the API, let me go open another tab, or I'll even split this window, I'll split it horizontally, and down here, I'll go to the website and start the website. So there's the weather hub and we'll .NET run this one. So I have both my API running up top here inside my uh, Windows PowerShell terminal here and down here I have the website running. If I go to the API here, I'll just copy that address and we'll open up Edge and browse to that. If I go to the Swagger address, there's all the content for my API. It's out there, it's running, it provides the ability for me to search across a series of locations that the National Weather Service here in the States calls zones, and I can choose and request a forecast, a live forecast, for a specific zone by going to this address. And we can see in our code exactly how that's configured to go and connect to the National Weather Service with this capability right here. I have a National Weather Service Manager that knows how to connect to apiweather.gov and request some data with some endpoints. There you go, there's my zones that knows how to connect and get that data, as well as over here, the ability to get forecast for a specific zone that's passed in. Okay, that looks pretty clear what it's doing there. That's a garden variety web API. If I go back to my terminal, I should be able to click through to this location. I'll just copy that address, open another tab, and I can get to my website that's using that API to show me here now real weather forecasts. Now, this is being recorded in 2024 in the fall. The locations and the forecasts that I'm showing on screen as part of this video might not be the same that you see as you navigate around here. It's going to change. There may be different weather at different times because this is a live service, okay? So you can learn more about the U.S. National Weather Service with a link that we've provided over here. But over there, I'm using a quick grid to present a list of all the different locations, the zones that are available. So if we go in here, I can quickly search for Philadelphia using that filter hamburger button there. And if I click on Philadelphia, I can scroll down and it makes a second request to that API to show you, here's the upcoming forecast for Philadelphia in October, 2024. And these, these look like forecasts that you might expect for the Philadelphia region. Highs around 80 this afternoon. Tonight, mostly clear in the evening, 
lows in the mid 50s, southwest winds 5 to 10 miles an hour, and so on and so forth. And you can see we, we put up eight forecasts on the screen. Not bad. It's an easy service for us to interact with and get some data out of so we can, we can learn more about what's going on with our weather forecasts. And because it's all being managed and run locally, I can cache some of this information and present it and share it with some of my colleagues and some of the folks that I work with to be able to take a look at the weather and, and hide all of that nonsense that we don't need from the National Weather Service API. So it's an interesting little service that we've got built here. But we want to start adding some capabilities for resiliency and, and um, reliability and be able to get some metrics coming out of this, some logging. Because right now, the only way that I get some logging is by looking at the console here. And that's hard to discern what exactly happened and requesting and back and forth. It's confusing how these are related to each other when I was just interacting with the website. And this is where the service defaults capabilities come in that we're going to introduce that .NET Aspire provides for your application system. Clearly here, I have a little microservice that's my API, and I've got my website. And I want to allow both of those projects to have some reasonable logging and metrics and reliability built into them in case there's any kind of an issue interacting with my services. Because as I'm, as I'm clicking around here, I, I could run into an issue navigating around and interacting with some of these. Right, if I just take a look at some of my capabilities here, there's Franklin. Well, can't locate weather for Lawrence in Alabama. If I go to Madison, well, that works. Let me try Lawrence again. Yeah, Lawrence works now. So how do I manage and, and work with that as I'm building a system and I want that reliability where sometimes these things, there it's in it's not always reliable to load and present that information. We do that with our service defaults. Let's head over to the documentation and we'll get started with that. The first thing we want to do to add service defaults into our application system is to create a service defaults project. Now, if you're in Visual Studio, you're going to right click on the solution and add a new project. And we're going to create a .NET Aspire service defaults project template. And I've got some screenshots here for folks that are in Visual Studio, how to get started and work with those. But if you're in Visual Studio Code, we can create a new .NET project using the, uh, the command palette inside of there. I'm actually going to do this at the command line by executing this command, .NET new Aspire service defaults, and we're going to name it service defaults. So I will cancel both these. And look, there's my error that I was getting inside my application. How would I have known? Let's clear that out. I'm going to jump up a folder and I'll execute that .NET new Aspire service defaults template and we'll name it service defaults. We'll create that. There it is. Let's add that into the solution. So I'll execute .NET SLN add service defaults. There it is. And now it's part of the solution. I'll go back over to Visual Studio Code. And if we take a look at our Solution Explorer, there's my API, there's my Weather Hub, and there's Service Defaults. Take a look at what's inside there. What, what are these Service Defaults? Well, it's a, it's a series of extensions that it will configure for your applications automatically. It'll do things like configure open telemetry add health check endpoints, service discovery capabilities so that it can discover other projects, other applications in the system and connect to them. We won't have to create a little DNS server that replicates and knows where the applications are running. It'll also set up HTTP client defaults so that it'll have some standard resilience built into it so it'll retry connections when they aren't able to connect properly. And we'll also get some service discovery in there so that we can locate the other components of our application system by name instead of having to specify some sort of localhost port combination. So 
will have all of those capabilities built in. And further down here, you can scroll down and see exactly how those various features are configured. I'll leave that to you to explore on your own time. We're going to configure the service defaults in both the API and the Weather Hub projects by adding references to the service defaults project, and then we're going to add an, a single line into both projects, builder, add service defaults, and actually we're going to add a second line. Maps, default endpoints will add right at the end so that it will add health checks into the application system. Let's head over to the command line and make these couple of changes. Now, if we were in Visual Studio, we could just add a reference, but I want to do this at the command line because everybody can do this work at the command line and make their projects better. So I'm up here in the top. I'm going to work with the API project. I will .NET add reference. And I'll just go up one to service default. And there it is. It added that reference. Down here, I'll go into the My Weather Hub project and I'll execute the exact same command .NET add reference up a folder service default. And there it is. It has that reference now in the project. Let's go add those capabilities for adding the service defaults into both projects. So I'll start with the API and we'll go into the program here and we're gonna add services to the container in the top half. Well, right here after we add the swagger generation capabilities, let's add service default. We'll go down to the bottom here and after map API endpoint, API endpoints, we'll do app map default endpoints. Okay, we'll do that once again for the web project. And I'll go find program over here. And right here, after it adds the, the Blazor services, we will once again add service defaults. I'll scroll down here. And after it maps the Razor components, app. map default endpoints. There it goes. Okay, that's all we needed. We can now run the application. Now, if we were in Visual Studio, we can have it run two applications, two projects at the same time by setting up multiple startup projects, but I'm, I'm not. So I'm actually going to run these as two projects, just like we had here previously. I'm in the, I'm in the API folder up here, so I'll .NET run that project. And down here in the website, I'll .NET run that one. There they are, they're both running. Let me go back to the website and I'll reload the application. There it is. And if we look back over here, we can see there's connection attempts that are being made from the website. Look at this, with standard retry policies. Ooh, I like seeing that already. Okay, okay. Let's, let's try clicking through here a little bit. So I'm just going to click into a couple of these to see if we get that error, right? Look, there was a little spinner there that ran for a little bit. Uh, okay, if I come back over here to my terminal, if we look up here, look at this. Right over here, Polly is reporting that it... it had a problem. Look, there was a 500 error coming back and Polly comes through and says, hey, we're gonna retry this. Here's another execution attempt with that standard retry policy. It was a resilience event occurred on retry and it came back properly with a 200 result code and everything ran properly. So we added that resiliency into our application. We've also got health checks in here now. So if I take this address and we just type slash health on the end, you'll see that my website reports it's healthy. And that may be important to you when you deploy your application and it's running in some sort of a large orchestrated system and you need to know when, when web servers are healthy or not, right? If I go over to my Swagger UI, 
it's still sitting there for my API and I can go to that same health endpoint and I can see that it reports that it's healthy. I didn't add these features. I didn't have to go and change any of my code. All we did was add service defaults and it enabled our HTTP client to behave better with retry capabilities to add that resilience. And it gave us health checks that did some default health monitoring inside of my web applications to make sure that they're, they're operating properly and return a healthy status when there's a probe that comes through from sort of from some sort of orchestration monitoring tool to see if our web servers are behaving properly. That's all for this episode in the series. We've learned how to add service defaults into our project to allow our websites, to allow our applications to run with a little bit more resiliency and to start reporting their health status. We're gonna get into more configuration with .NET Aspire in the next video in this series. I hope you come back and check it out. I've got lots more to show you, including our new .NET Aspire dashboard and how to configure and deploy your application that's been built with .NET Aspire. My name is Jeff Fritz. Thanks so much for watching.